Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Do you want to start a podcast? I know I did. And you're listening to it. Thanks to the help of Anchor. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's totally free and has everything you need in a podcast in one place. You can record, edit your podcast right from your phone or computer and distribute it to listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Everything you need all in one place, completely free. What's stopping you? Go get Anchor. One of the greatest football coaches of all time, an influencer. Who made the game what it is today possible. A man from a background that sounds like a movie like The Princess Bride. A man who had credits in acting in multiple theaters. A man that we hear his name every single year. But no one ever talks about who he was. That man is John Heisman, who the Heisman Trophy is named after. We're going to jump into his life, his career, what made him so unique and amazing in this episode of Sports Moments. Let's jump into it. Welcome to the Sports Moments Podcast, where every sports moment deserves its replay. I'm your host, Ethan Reese, your sports historian and giant goofball, which best describes this show, sports history and goofballness thrown in there. This is not a Dateline Only Facts podcast. I will joke around, tell the most factually accurate story I can. But have a good time doing it. So now let's sit back and jump into the sports time machine. John Naismith. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, October 23rd, 1869. It's a long time ago. In 1869, just a look back, Ulysses. S. Grant, a major general in the Civil War, which recently was just ended, was president on March 4th. And Andrew Johnson was just finishing his presidency and it was a transition to Ulysses. Other major things that happened in 1869, Jefferson Davis who was the president of the Confederacy, had his treason charges dropped. Obviously, after the Civil War, this was a contentious time, and they dropped those charges. Also this year, the American Museum of National History started in New York City. This is the one that is in all the 90th Museum movies, very famous, very popular museum. And this year also, the Golden Spike is driven, marking the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in Promonte, Utah, connecting one end of the country to the other by railway for the first time. This year also, the Cincinnati Red Stockings opened baseball season of the first 
fully professional baseball team. This is the first team where every single player was played. And John Wesley Hyatt patented the first plastic. The world's first rodeo was held on July 4th this year in Deer Trail, Colorado. And this is fitting was also the first intercollegiate football game between Rutgers University and Princeton University where Rutgers won 6 to 4 in the very first college football game which is very fitting for the story of John Heisman one of the greatest most influential college football coaches of all time now John comes from a unique background that dates back to Europe and here is a little bit of his story of how his parents came together. Michael von Bogart was John's father. He was the son of all satin noblemen from the eastern France. And one day he gathered the townspeople to notify them of their new princess. He got on the ledge and said, Kingdom! I have picked a princess! A commoner like yourselves, kneel for Princess Buttercup. And everyone kneeled and slowly the beautiful Princess Buttercup walked out into the commoners. Except for one person, the father of Michael von Bogart, Byron von Bogart, stood up and yelled, Boo! Boo! You will not marry a commoner. My family will not have commoners in our family. <laughs> Sorry, I can't keep it together. That is somewhat a scene from The Princess Bride. Very reminiscent of this story. Makes me just think about it a lot. But no, Michael von Bogart was a nobleman. Was, you know, in line for the throne you know, Byron von Bogart was his father, was the, the, the king or the, the nobleman of the time. And he disowned this connection. And just so you know, John Heisman's mom was not named Buttercup, like in The Princess Bride. Her name was Sarah Ann Heisman. Notice that. So when Michael didn't want to follow in the nobleman life, so he's like, I'm running away with his true love. They went to America. And he adopted his wife's name and became Michael Heisman. And that is how John Heisman became John Heisman and not John Von Bogart. And luckily, he came over here and could grow the game of football because that was not a popular sport <laughs> over in so John grows up in Titusville, Ohio, and he goes to a couple of Titusville elementary schools where he's remembered for enjoying bobsled riding, which we were bobsledding back then? That was a thing? And who had a bobsled? This just blows my mind that we were bobsledding back then. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And so he was just no, known as, you know, the kid around town liked to do sports, but bobsledding for some reason was the one they talked about. <laughs> Until 1984, when his world was changed forever, and it changed the course of American sports forever, when Titusville High School put together their first football team. Backyard Brawl was what they played more back then. And they showed them more structured, civilized games. John Heisman bought a rule book for 10 cents, which was a lot of money back then. He put, he saved up, got, got it for him to learn. And he, it said he retired to seclusion. He was a great, avid reader. And he wanted to learn everything about this game. He labored over such puzzling terminologies as a touchdown, safety, offsides. This is all part of the game back then. And it's just like you don't know a sport 
when someone watches football for the first time, they don't know what's going on. What's a touchdown? What's the safety? Or if you have someone from another country come, they don't understand the sport at all. So you had to explain it to them. But there was no one around to explain it to him. He had to read it and learn it that way. John later reported that the high school team had little use for the fuzz buzz of the official rules. And instead, the 15-man team had the time of their lives assaulting a black rubber ball down the expansive field. The ball belonged to whoever was strongest or fleet enough to take it. It was more like rugby than football. But that's how they played. Titusville High School football in 1884 to 1886 were formative years shrouded in obscurity. No information exists about the local team during its first three years of existence. It's a small kind of club-like thing. Of course it doesn't exist. You don't go around to the local pickup games and keep track of everything now. Why would they keep track of it then? So all they have is John's written recollections in a brief 1885 newspaper item, which mentions the high school team and one of its members, William Johnson, which is probably John Heisman. Sometimes he was written as William J. Heisman. Now his father... Michael Heisman refused to watch his son play football, calling it Bastille or Savage or like a savage, beastly of a sport. Little did he know that his son was kind of a football genius and would modernize the sport into being less savage than what it was at the time. So some of the recollections that John wrote down for those forgotten years of football in high school was the field was 110 yards long, and sometimes they played up to three days in a row in order to cover all the expenses in league play that they had because you needed to sell tickets, you needed to get people to come, you had to do ways to cover it. And that's how they did it. And league play didn't start until 1902. So this was all basically club style. This was grassroots, really getting the game started, really forming the game. So John graduated in 1887. We'll jump into this a little bit, but John was was into drama as well. He was not just a jock. He was into drama loved Shakespeare, loved performing, and none of his speeches were like performances to him, his chance to really go out and use his Shakespearean knowledge to impart his wisdom on the players he was coaching. And he was the salutatorian of his school, which, judging by the size of the area, <laughs> there may have been five kids. So to be the salutatorian, not. Nah, that great, but you know, you can have some very smart people in a small area. So who knows? And there's no exactly accurate amount of who was there and how many there were. But they described his speech at the graduation as a dramatist and a sermonizer, full of dramatic emphasis and fire and showed how masterpieces of Shakespeare depicted the ends of unchecked passion. This doesn't sound like your normal football guy. Yeah, he was very well-rounded and used drama throughout his life to help football in his sports programs. So John enrolled at the Ivy League Brown University, named after... The poop that everyone takes once they realize how hard it is. No. It is Brown University, Ivy League, great school. He studied law and played football and baseball. 
He was undersized, roughly, at the time for being a offensive lineman. He was about 5'8", 158 pounds, which undersized, that was average. That was almost exactly average at that time. The average person was shorter and weighed less than they do now. <laughs> A lot less. The average weight in America. Whoa! So he played center on the Brown football team for three years. And you'll notice he actually plays multiple years more than you play now. This is before the NCAA. This is before all the restrictions. So there's, you can go to a different school. You can play multiple years. There's no limit on this. It's up to you. So he played three seasons there, and he temporarily dropped the sport while he was there. And then he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania, where he studied for another two years and played there as well. And he had this great plan. Remember, he was a Shakespearean dramatic actor, which you know those make great lawyers. He was planning to be the greatest lawyer in America. No, but he he wasn't wasn't his plan. He just wanted to be a lawyer. That was his goal. Unfortunately, he had an eye injury caused by lightning. Not struck by lightning, but it struck so near that the flash injured his eyes. And he even had to take his final exams orally instead of writing it down because he couldn't see the questions, so he had to do it orally. But he still passed, still graduated, so still had the knowledge, was able to do everything, which is really impressive, too, because if you can't see to take the test... You can't read books. You have to remember everything that is being told to you in class. So, great mind. So, after this, he decided to go into his love of sports. He became the first coach at Oberlin University in 1892. And that year, in their debut season, their first season, they had a perfect season. Obviously, they didn't play as many games, and having a perfect season didn't mean you won the national championship or anything. That wasn't a thing back then. But there was one game that is disputed against Michigan. This was, I know you're going to hear these small schools playing these big schools now, like Michigan, Ohio State. They beat Ohio State twice. No way Oberlin now beats Ohio State twice. Both schools are still around. Both schools have football team. Oberlin is a Division three school, no scholarships. Ohio State, one of the great, <laughs> greatest football programs in the country. If they played each other, it would be a massacre. But back then, they beat them twice. And you played the same team twice in a year. It kind of shows you the limitations of who had a football team and who you were playing. But against Michigan... The the score is debated who actually won this game because one of the referees was an Oberlin substitute player. And he ruled that time expired before Michigan scored the final point. And Michigan scored the final point with no Oberlin players being on the field. So Michigan can say they won in their books. But really, they didn't win anything according to the actual official. All this stuff is kind of circumstantial back in the day. Things were a lot more loosey-goosey with the statistics and the tracking of information. So in 1893, John heads over to Butchdale College, just about an hour down the road. To take over their football and baseball coaching positions. Fortunately, he had a losing baseball season, but led the football team to a five and two season. And this is where 
he invented, created, whatever you want to call it, the snap. When the center in football gives the ball to the quarterback, we're used to seeing the center go between his legs, either give it straight to the quarterback in his hands when the quarterback is under center, when he's right behind him, literally touching the quarter, the center's butt, or shotgun where he's roughly four to five yards back and the ball is thrown between the legs back to the quarterback. That's what we're used to seeing today. But before this, the ball was rolled or kicked back to the quarterback and it was just a little less efficient. But he created this because he had a quarterback that was like 6'5". And this was a little unusual back then. Remember, the average height back then was 5'8". He was the average height. So when you get a quarterback that tall, not unusual today, but back then it was much more unusual to have a quarterback that tall. So he had the, the center toss the ball to the quarterback. And thus the snap was created. In 1894, after just one game beating Ohio State, he just loved to beat Ohio State. And who doesn't, right? After one game beating Ohio State, he returned to Oberlin. Again, just about an hour down the road, and he went 4-3-1 and one there with losses to Michigan and Penn State. Yeah, again, they're playing these well-known schools from these little colleges you probably never even heard of. It's just showing you. This was all beginning. Football was still growing and getting, climbing up the ranks. And how you can go from one team, play one game, and go sh- swish, switch to another team midseason. That just doesn't happen. Almost would never happen today. I, I, you can have a guy leave after one game, but you're not going to have him go sh- coach another team that same season. Not happening today, ever. So in 1895... John Heisman had gone down to Texas and was, you know, working to make some money. You know, you didn't make money coaching football. It was still a pastime, still something you did kind of on the side. So he was down in Texas making some money. And Auburn was looking for a coach. You know, their first coach was a professor, a history professor. Obviously, that usually doesn't work out. And by... 1894, they had been through four coaches, and they are ready to really hire a coach that was had experience coaching football. And they had just joined the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association. This was a precursor to the NCAA. It was starting to organize teams and rules and everything. So this was really getting started, and this was where it happened. And so they're really looking for that experienced coach now that they're in this. And they offer to pay John Heisman. This is the first time a coach has been offered to be paid. He's going to be paid to be the football and baseball coach. About $500, which back then was roughly $16,000, $17,000 today. So not a high-paying job. Not a job that was going to make you rich like it does today. Auburn's coach today makes $5 million a year. Crazy, right? So he started there. They went 2-1 and one beating Alabama and Georgia. Now, I know Auburn is now known as a power football school, so he's at a school you know and now beating, again, other power football schools. And University of Georgia, just so you know, at this time was coached by Pop Warner. Probably recognize that name for all the kids' youth football leagues. You're usually called Pop Warner Leagues. And while playing them, they developed the hidden ball trick, where you hide the ball so that the other team doesn't know where it is. Very common in backyard football or pickup games, everything like that. You will see it every now and then, like a high school game, maybe in a small college game, but you don't see it very much anymore. A lot harder to do. A lot more things are done 
today to prevent that. But back then, it worked. And they on to 1890. Another season where they grew. Winning season. Nothing crazy except for they had a player die in the game against Virginia. And this is showing how brutal this sport was back in the day. People were dying playing this sport, and they still continued to play it. And after this season, the football team actually finished $700 in debt, which is around $20,000 now. That's a lot of money to finish in debt. And so in order for the team to continue to go, John Heisman took a role in the theater as the theater producer and staged the comic play David Gerwick, written in 1856 by Thomas William Robinson about the 18th century famous actor and theater manager David Gerwick. The play premiered in Birmingham, not the Alabama Birmingham. We're talking about the England Birmingham. And was successful enough to move to London as well in 1864. The play was the writer's first commercial success and was revered throughout the Victorian era. Okay, so the story behind this, the plot behind this is kind of a rom-com type of thing. It's set in the 1740s in London where you know, arranged marriage is very common. This woman named Ada has already been arranged to be married to this man named Richard Chivey. And she doesn't want to marry him. She is infatuated in love with this David Garrick character, this actor-producer character. And she's in love with him. Her father confronts him says, can you stop this? Can you like shoo her away or anything like that? He says, I don't even know her. I can maybe talk to her and just say, there's no way. I'll, I'll convince her that there's no way we can be together. Well, when he actually meets her for a party, he realizes that he has been admiring her for a long time. And it's just the girl he admired from afar. And it's that girl he has been admiring. He does actually want to be with her. And her fiancé challenges him to a duel. And he accepts the duel because he does actually want to be with her. Garrick eventually wins the duel against Chivy, But, and this isn't a fight to the death. It's just a duel, like fencing duel. I'll beat you in the fencing duel. He sees how much her father loves her afterwards. Even though I won, I think you should honor your father's wishes and go marry this man. And because he does that, the father agrees, no, you are a very honorable man by allow, by offering that I will allow her to marry you. And there you go. That's the story. And John was acting in it. Well, he was an actor. He was, uh, he was an actor. And so he used this play <laughs> to finance <laughs> the football team. Go ahead. Go out there. Find any time this has ever happened before. I cannot I cannot tell you there I can tell you one fact I know for sure is that there has never been another football coach that took an acting job to <laughs> to support the team. Just imagine like the LA Rams. Sean McVay, you know, we're we're in debt a little bit. You know, can you go run this action movie with Dorian Johnson? You know, you've got the face for it. You're, you're a likable guy. You look good. You're smart. I think you can do this. Let, let's go, you know, um, Rampage 2 with Sean McVay. You can include the football team in it. It's going to be a great thing. The football team takes on, you know, all these giant creatures with Dwayne Johnson. I think it'll be a great movie. <laughs> and no, great movie idea, right? I think that would be work. <laughs> I think it's just a crazy, crazy thing. And we'll go in a little bit later onto his acting stuff because he did act throughout his life. It wasn't just like this time, you know, he continued to act here and there. And like, he wasn't just sports oriented. He wasn't just sports oriented. He loved acting. He loved the theater. So having made enough money 
for another season in 1898, the team won two out of three games, losing only to the undefeated North Carolina team. And yes, they only played three games. Remember, scheduling was different, and he probably only made enough games for them to play three games. <laughs> so things were different back then. Then we get to 1899, because tonight we're going to party like it's 1899. Woo! Do, do, do. The 1899 team, which is considered his best while at Auburn, ran an early version of the hurry-up offense. You know, just, we got these plays, we're going to run these plays, just go up there, go quick, 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 as quick as we could. Heisman recalled, I don't think having ever seen so fast a team as that was. Very common when you're doing something new, and he, this season, he also did some other things that may not have been so good. He, in one game against Georgia, uh, he had fitted the linemen with straps and handles under their belts so that other linemen could hold on to them, preventing a, like a Red Rover, Red Rover kind of situation where you're holding on to each other's hands and you had to break through that line. He was creating that kind of situation. You had to break through. And it, obviously that wasn't legal or anything, but it wasn't like in the rule books. It's one of those things that you can do it because it's not in the rule books, but we'll put it in the rule books <laughs> tomorrow. And so umpires literally had to cut them so they couldn't use that strategy continuing. And they they'd lost just one game, 11 to 10, to the Iron Man. I am Iron Man. Their mascot obviously was, you know, Tony Stark with Iron Man. No. <laughs> the Iron Man of Shawnee. Just more based off the men making iron in the area, not the actual Iron Man. He wasn't even thought of yet. And that will be another few decades, multiple decades, before he's even thought of and put onto a comic book, let alone a movie screen. After that 1899 season, John Heisman left and was going to Clemson. And he wrote a farewell letter that I'm sure he did in his most thespian way. And he said, tears in my eyes and tears in my voice. Tears even in my trembling hand. You will not feel hard towards me. You will forgive me. You will not forget me. Let me ask to retain your friendship. Can a man be associated for five successful seasons with a grand old Auburn? Toil for her, befriended by her, starve for her, and yet not love her. What? That is actually the letter he wrote. Very grandiose, very Shakespearean theater like. That is. John Heisman in a nutshell. And I imagine his speeches were like that. Where the players are like, what did, what did he just say? What did, what I, I don't understand what he just said. I'm not saying football players are dumb. I'm not trying to say that. But I would be like, wait, what? Usually it's like, rah, rah, rah. This, was, this is deep. This is very deep. <laughs> so John Heisman, a very deep man, a very Shakespearean man. A renaissance man. So John Heisman was hired by Clemson University to coach football and baseball. He coached at Clemson from 1900 to 1903. And he was the first Clemson coach who ever had experience at another school. This is something you see kind of throughout his tenure that schools are starting to realize football is a draw to their school. And we need good coaches to be able to have a good team. He is still the highest winning percentage in school history in both football and baseball, which is impressive when you consider how good Clemson has been recently, at least in football. Baseball, not widely known, but he still is the number one guy in that over 100 years later. It's a lot of time.
He also got a pay bump. He got a raise up to $1,800 a year, which equates to about $60,000 in today's money. So he's getting to a point where, like, even today, that is sustainable money. Kind of the average office worker makes around that or a little bit below that. So he's getting to a good salary through his sports. So this was a big raise, a big boost to him. While he was there in his coaching for the baseball team, he went 28-6-1. For the football team, he won SIAA titles in 1900, 1902, and 1903. And by the time he was hired, he was the undisputed master of Southern football. You'll, you'll notice as we go through the little tactics that he does, that he is so much like Bill Belichick, finding little loopholes or little changes that, you know, you don't think about. And you're like, is that cheating or is that just being smart? And I know a lot of people hate Bill Belichick and a lot of people love Bill Belichick, but he is a very intelligent football coach. And he finds these loopholes. And let me tell you, even though they're loopholes, if you think you got a chance to win, wouldn't you try it too? In you know that first season, they went six and zero. They beat big schools like South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, and VPI, which eventually becomes Virginia Tech. This is also the year that Heisman joins Spooner Dramatic Company in Tampa, Florida. He's Still acting. He mainly does this in the summer. He's an actor in the summer. And he still goes and acts as he is coaching. He, he never loses that love. It's still a big part of him. But I don't know what he acted in that year. In 1901, Clemson beats Gully Ford on opening day 122 to zero, scoring the most points in Clemson history. And then the next week, they tie Tennessee six and six. They finish the season three one and one. I, I, I <laughs> it's so hard for me to fathom going from scoring a hundred and twenty two, an almost unfathomable football score, to six the next week. Obviously, the competition probably between Gully Ford and Tennessee very different. Would be very different today. You probably know Tennessee football. Probably never heard of Gully Ford. Very, very unusual. And this, crazily enough, is not the most points he ever scored as a coach and the most point differential he ever scored as a coach. I'd like to point out also, he shut them out. He didn't just beat them by offense. He just shut them out. In 1901, Heisman joined the Dixie Stock Company. He performed in several plays while in Mississippi. And there, he actually received his first romantic lead as Ahmed in Kamali play. And it's kind of like Pretty Woman. Guy falls for a call girl, a prostitute. Um, they fall in love. But a little bit different in this story is that she loves him so much, she doesn't want to ruin his reputation. And so she leaves him so he can live his life to the fullest. And she just goes back to what she was doing. So a little different, kind of a happy ending. But, you know, it's kind of under those lines. I will say this this found very interesting. It's called Kamali because that is a flower. And that is, it's called that because that's how you would know whether she was good to go as a prostitute. It would be white. Or if she was menstruating, it would be red. They should put, she put that flower in her hair, and that's how you would know. Wow, that was <laughs> that was unexpected. It was very promiscuous and very uh, surprising to me. Interesting, very interesting. So in 1902, Heisman did something a little shady, but something like you see in high school movies or uh, kind of funny TV shows a lot. He he sent. Uh, a player before the Georgia Tech game to take all the players for Georgia Tech out for a party. 
that whole night before. And so his team was well rested and went against Georgia Tech and they beat them 44 to 5 because they were so exhausted and so hungover from partying the night before. <laughs> they also had a game where they beat Forum 28 to 0, where there was an oak tree in the middle of the field, and he used this as an extra blocker while he was coaching. So good coaching on the fly, but why is there an oak tree in the middle of the field? So this year they went six and one. Uh, their only loss came to South Carolina. And in 1902, of course, he managed the Crumb Park Stock Company, another acting company. He started also the Heisman Dramatic Stock Company in 1903, which he spent the summers performing where he performed in because she loved him so. I can't find anything about this. It's not very common play done today, and I couldn't find any synopsis about this. But after he was done acting, the team you know, went 4-1-1. One, and one. After the season ended, a postseason game was scheduled with Cumberland, billed as the champions of the South. Clemson and Cumberland tied 11-11, with both teams therefore being listed as champions. But Heisman, he said, no, Cumberland's the champion. This year, he also met his first wife, an actress, of course. He's who. <laughs> why do you think he's doing these plays? He's looking to get the chicks. Chicks love actors. Chicks love the dramatic type, and he was that. Of course, why else would this normal football coach that is very intelligent and loves the game of football do anything besides trying to get chicks at the theater? <laughs> so he met Evelyn McCollum Cox while well, acting her stage name was evelyn barksdale <laughs> how do you come up with barksdale i can understand why i want to go by cox but <laughs> barksdale is that much better really she was a widow with a single child a 12 year old boy named carlisle they married during the season of 1903 in october they also for some reason threw this in they shared a house with a family poodle named woo Great name for a poodle. Woo! Get over here. Hey, woo! What are you doing? Woo! Stop that. Woo! Why are you putting me on the floor? Woo! I'm sure they didn't say that like that every time, but that's how I, I say it. I say, woo! And they said he used to feed him ice cream. He moved to Georgia Tech because after after Clemson beat Georgia Tech 73-0, to zero, demolished him, they... Like, we want to be one of the best. And this guy is obviously one of the best. So they lured him over. And they even hung a banner that said, Tech gets Heisman. They were so excited to get this guy. So excited for the that opportunity. And they gave him a raise, of course. It was up to about $75,000 was his raise. It's a big amount. You go from making 60000 to 70000 That's a huge amount in today's money. It's a big amount back then. And they also gave him 30% of the home ticket sales. So that's a big chunk too. I don't know exactly how much was sold back then, how much their stadium was, but that's a big sell. And so it was a big uptick from what he was doing. And he had gotten raises at Clemson. This was only a $50 raise from Clemson at the time because he had gotten raises from when he was first hired. Just about fifteen hundred dollars. So it's it's a it's a raise, but it's not a huge raise. But the thirty percent home ticket sales could really put you over the top. So a change here also is that while he was there, he got that raise, he got that extra money. He was the football coach, the baseball coach, and when they started a basketball team, he became the basketball coach. So you'll notice kind of towards his time here, this is his longest tenured position 16 years he slowly stops acting mainly because he's so much more busier than he was before coaching another sport so we're getting into the football season and heisman never had a losing season ever at georgia tech he took this team that wasn't a great team always a punching bag for him when he was at clemson and he built them into a perennial wouldn't say power, but eventually he got him to that point 
But in his beginning years, he bought the, he got them into a respectable team. The first season he was at Georgia Tech, they went 8-1-1. It was their first winning season in over 10 years. So he took this down on the luck team and he made them respectable. The next year is when they adopted their moniker that they go by today, the Yellow Jackets. They have a more fierce name, the Yellow Jackets. We'll sting ya! We'll sting ya in the defense. We'll sting ya on the offense. Boo, 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 boo. I don't know why they chose that. But they went 8-0-1. And, and he was getting known as a wizard. Like we said, he was a master of the Southern you know, football. And now he's becoming a wizard because he's doing all these creative things and challenging the status quo. After the 1905 football season, the Chicago Tribune reported 18 players had been killed and... 159 seriously injured players that year in college football. That is a lot. Just imagine if that happened nowadays. There's no way this sport would still be played. So it even caused the president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, to demand that they do something to change what was going on in college football. We cannot have our young kids dying or ruining their lives physically because of a game. And this started the what we know today as the NCAA. So they could form safer rules and eventually you know, organize better into having championships. And one of the coaches, they put together committees and groups of people to help with this. And one of them was John Heisman. He helped create rules like legalizing the forward pass and later changing how the games were played instead of two halves, changing it to four quarters for safety to allow more rest time for all the players. So then we go on to the next year, 1906. They created the jump ship. This is the first time they used the jump shift versus Swanee University. And what the jump shift is, is when everyone but the center moves at once. You may have seen this sometimes. It's usually done in trick plays. He used this and eventually he develops it and uses it more and more. It's really to catch the other team off guard and give you an advantage. So if you move everyone to one side and you hike the ball and you run to that side, all your players are on that side, can really help you block and have more opportunity where the defense wasn't ready for every single player to be on that side and their their defense more becomes reactive than being able to dissect what was going on. The next year, the was his worst year at Georgia Tech. 1907, they went 4-4. Four and four. That's your worst year. That's a pretty good worst year. Until 1915, that's when they start winning championships. They had put together championships for the SIAA. That con- it, it became more of a conference. Between 1915 and 1918, they had a record of 31-2. and two. They were great dominating, and they won four straight conference titles 1916 this was the year this is the that has the game the game that everyone talks about for john heisman that seems mythical it is the game where georgia tech without throwing a single forward pass the forward pass was legalized 10 years before by john heisman so you would think he would use it but without you using a, a single forward pass they defeated Cumberland College 222 to 0. You will never ever see that score again. Ever. It's it's not I don't even think you could really make that happen in Madden if you put it all the way on easy and you are an expert. That is a difficult thing to do. Cumberland's greatest individual play in the whole game was when their fullback 
ran for a six-yard loss. That was their best play. They dominated on defense and offense and special teams completely. You have to just score that. They were up 126 to zero at the half. And Heisman told his players, you guys are doing all right, team. We're ahead, but we can't tell those Cumberland players have up their sleeves. So they may spring a surprise. So be alert. Hit them clean, but hit them hard. You're up 126 to zero. The game should be called by now. And you're still like, watch out. They may do some things. They even changed the second half, the, the last two quarters, to be 12 minutes instead of 15 because it was getting out of hand. The reason why Heisman was doing this was because earlier that year, this Cumberland school, their baseball team, ran up the score on their Georgia Tech baseball team that he was coaching, beating them 22-0. to zero. Heisman was vengeful. (laughs) He was mad they beat them like that, and he held a grudge for months. And he's like, when we get to them, we're going to beat them. And in 1917, it is the year that Georgia Tech finally wins their first national championship. In air quotes, national championship. This was before they actually held a game to name a national championship. You were named by a, a newspaper or an organization that you are the national championship. You were the best team, according to them. So so you can say, oh, yeah, we're national championships, but, you know. But this was the first time a Southern team had actually won the championship. So Southern football was getting to national prominence. In 1918, John Heisman felt like he was doing a lot, so he cut back into only coaching football that year. And Georgia Tech went 6-1 and one and eclipsed 100 points three different times that year. They were a scoring machine. But unfortunately, personal life kind of got in the way with him taking Georgia Tech to continued prominence. Him and his wife were having problems, and they got divorced. And he chose to stay in Atlanta and finish out the next season. He left Georgia Tech after the 1990 team, moved on up, moving on up to Penn University, that place where they do a lot of schooling, moving on up. So Heisman went back to Penn, and from 1920 to 1922, he had three winning seasons. Nothing of note, really, in those seasons. You know, we went six and four one year, four, three, and two another, six and three. So taking a team that isn't very football oriented or very trying to get into it to respectability, but not national prominence. Then he changed to Washington Jefferson which has a great team name. They are the Presidents. So be very scared if you go play Washington Jefferson Presidents because, you know, they're going to be giving speeches and campaigning the whole time. It's a very scary mascot. Very, very scary. Or he only coached at Washington Jefferson for one year and, of course, had a winning season. Went 6-1-1. and one. Great season for all accounts. And then he wanted to get back to Texas. He had been to Texas before. So he went down there and coached his final four seasons of coaching down at Rice University. The reason also he chose Rice University is he had met Edith Mora Cole, a student at Butchell College, which if you remember, that was the second school he went to. He had met her then when he was coaching there together, and they met again in 1924 when he was finishing up at Washington Jefferson. And she was in the area. At that time, they decided, you know, we're hitting it off. Let's get married. And then they decided to, you know, move down to Texas and restart our lives. After he accepted that position, 
after they were married, they went down to Rice University, where he became the full-time head coach and athletic director. He only had one losing season, so all the rest were like about 500. And this very last season was his only losing season as a coach. His overall coaching record is 186 wins to 70 losses with 18 ties. That is a 71% winning percentage. Very, very high for coach. And we go to baseball. And he had a 199 wins to 108 losses. It's a 64.5 win percentage. Very good win percentage. And then his basketball teams at Georgia Tech, he wasn't a good basketball coach, probably. <laughs> First year, we went one and six. <laughs> he had only one winning season. So he went nine and 14 as a basketball coach. So 39 win percentage, not very good. Rice was his final coaching job, and that led him to go to um, New York, and he joined the Downtown Athletic Club in Manhattan University. And he became the athletic director of that club. And they started this award in 1935 to the best college player east of the Mississippi. So they had this award. And what's funny is Heisman rejected the idea. He thought that the teams should be recognized you know, as national championships, not individual players. But later he realized that it was actually when an a individual player won the award, it was because his team was great as well, and it kind of shut a good light for his team as well. So they did this in 1935 to start with. Unfortunately, John died of pneumonia at in 1936 which is really sad because at the time he had just started writing history of football and i think that that would have been a great story to to read and understand from this man that it was so theatrical and so so much of a wordsmith that i am not (laughs) words words hard for me word word, words hard even though i do podcasts words hard it is something I wish could have been done and finished. It would have been great to see his memories and everything and his recollection of the sport that he helped, you know, create a modernized version of and a safer version so people weren't dying all the time playing the sport. Immediately after his passing, the club decided to name the award for the best player after Heisman. And this is how it became the Heisman Trophy. Interesting note, the Heisman statue is not John Heisman. It is not necessarily anybody. It is a sculptor's rendition of a football player. He went and had some football players pose, and those poses he made into a sculpture, and that is what the Heisman Trophy is based on and has nothing to do with his actual look or the look of any player and it is interesting that a lot of the college trophies now are named after a player that played that position like there's the best quarterback the best running back the best lineman the best kicker all these other awards are named after players but the best player overall is named after a coach very interesting obviously the with the downtown athletic club didn't think that this award would be what it is today, which is this national event, this thing that's tracked throughout the college football season. That's guessed about that you can bet on before the season even starts. Who's going to win this award? It is such a big award and no one could have guessed that it would have been what it is today. But that is why you hear John Heisman for the best player overall but you may not know who he is because he coached over 100 years ago and he the award started you know 90 over 90 years ago so it's 
that is John Heisman and how the Heisman Trophy got named after John Heisman. Let's go through some takeaways from this from this great man and that was a great influencer into the game of football. Number one, he was an actor. I'm not saying other coaches haven't been actors. There's been plenty of football players that were actors. But he was an actor and continuously acted while he was still coaching, which is something that a lot of people maybe act in high school and stuff, and then they give it up like as they grow up and go into the adult world. But he loved the theater and his speeches, as you can see by some of the things that he wrote and talked about, were very theatrical and I think it was very motivational and for the players at that period and that fit him. Number two, if it wasn't by some freak of nature, he may have never coached football. He may have became a lawyer. A lightning struck close enough to him to temporarily blind him enough or cause damage enough to his eyesight that he didn't think he could be a lawyer anymore he able he was able to get his degree in law through an oral exam because he couldn't see the questions on the paper and because of that he led him to a coaching career that was very prominent number three he was the first coach to get paid coaches didn't get paid back then and he worked his way up from getting paid you know basically minimum wage today to a a, a decent salary for a person to coach a game that multiple sports he could baseball for years and years he loved baseball too and he held grudges in his baseball team that led to his biggest defeat or his biggest win ever in college football and number five john heisman the name heisman is actually his mother's maiden name they took the, adopted the name because his father was a nobleman that wanted to follow his true love which may have led him to love the theater with that theatrical love story that his parents had. Maybe that was it. So this is John Heisman, a great man, a great coach, a great actor. Like, what what a renaissance man for sports. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.